What's up, everyone? Welcome to Bill Bronze and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Ron Bafflestone. So today we're having another battle report for my Molbron Dowlock Stone build, which I've been playing on a Westmarch server called the Forged Concordance. And I think it's super awesome. I'm having a lot of fun there. So I put all of the relevant information in the video description below. Feel free to check it out and maybe we can adventure together. So today's session was called Treasure of the Deep Lord and it was run by DM Nordy. And at the Forge Concordance, DM Nordy has a rather infamous reputation as a player killer. Apparently his table is really super tough. And so I've been uh, really looking forward to playing at this table. And in fact, I was uh, told by some people that I know that um, I was really lucky because last week I actually got into a Nordy game at fifth level and then it got canceled. And everyone was saying, God, you're so lucky. What kind of idiot are you for going into a Nordy game at only fifth level? You totally need to make sixth before you're going to have a chance of surviving. It's like, okay, maybe. Um, and as it turns out, they were actually right because I did make sixth level just before this game. This was my first time as a sixth level PC. And it turns out that the new powers that I gained at sixth were pretty clutch in this one. So, uh, in fact, before we get into the play-by-play, -play, let's go ahead and look at that uh, updated 6th level character sh uh, sheet of mine. And uh, I'll go over the new abilities that I added. One was Elemental Gift, which is one of the best abilities in the game, so super happy to add it. With Elemental Gift comes a bonus action, no concentration fly speed with hover. So, yeah, super amazing. The only downside of that one is the 30 foot move speed that comes with it, which is pretty slow when you're talking about flying. But still, bonus action, no concentration, hover, yeah, all of that's just amazeballs. And then it also comes with bludgeoning resistance. And bludgeoning resistance is fantastic. Bludgeoning is the second most common damage type out there after piercing. So yeah, really nice one. And it's definitely the best of the uh, ones that the genie locks get. So I added Elemental Gift at 6th level, and then I also added two spells. I uh, got a, fruit, a new one, and then I replaced Protection from Evil and Good, and I added Thunder Step and Remove Curse. So Thunder Step I was very happy to add because it's a teleport like Misty Step, except it's got a 90 foot range, which is way better than the 30 foot range of Misty Step when you're trying to get away from really dangerous stuff. Plus, I can bring someone with me, which I can't with Misty Step, and it does some damage. You know, 3d10 uh, force damage in a 10-foot radius uh, beyond my 5-foot square, so it's actually like about 25 feet across. So a decent area. You can get, you know, a couple of things. And, you know, if I'm escaping anyway, why not give him a little FU kiss and, uh, you know, do some damage on the way out. So very happy to add Thunder Step. I did keep Misty Step as well because Misty Step is a bonus action, and that means that I can use my action to see through my familiar's senses and then get eyes on a target and then use my bonus action to teleport through there. So Misty Step is still useful. I will phase it out at one point, but um, I still want to make some scrolls with it and stuff, so I decided to keep it for another level. And then I also added Remove Curse, and this is just you know a contingency in case I get cursed. I've already fought mummies, uh, I've already fought werebears, there are curses in this game, and, you know, there are potions and stuff that I can take for taking damage, for being poisoned, all of that. Curses are not so easy. So I decided to add Remove Curse, and I'm sure it'll come in handy one of these days. So yeah, that was the character that I took into this session. And to start things off, Bill Braun rolled up to the job board looking for a gig. And it was a kind of a rainy day, and there were throngs of rookies, you know, milling about bronze and iron badges, but I was looking for a steel gig mission, and I finally saw a steel mission in the hands of Hildy Von Noon, who was a cleric bard who looked like a pretty girl, but was actually a warforged. So think Seven of Nine from uh, Star Trek, you know, but she had that, uh, you know, weird dichotomy of, you know, being really pretty and then being really robotic at the same time. Uh, so never met her before, introduced myself, said, hey, I'm a steel badge looking for a gig, and, uh, you know, hey, I was on the team. So then we needed to fill the team out, and the first guy that walked up was Azon Zylar, 
who was a, a ladron, a spring version, uh, and he was a, a rogue, a swashbuckler. But he seemed like a space case, dude, like Looney Tunes, like really spacey and uh, sloshed in, in his cups, uh, just wandering around. Anyway, he seemed to have been to this place before that we were we needed to go, uh, which I'll talk about the job in a minute. Um, but yeah, I, you know, honestly, Bill Braun wasn't too impressed. The dude seemed rather incompetent, but, you know, he'd been there before, so at least he was going to be good for Intel, right? Uh, and then we finally filled out the team with Oryx Winslow, who is a half-elf armor artificer. And he too, man, had like this most, like really morose attitude. He was all like, oh, basically worthless and pathetic, but you know, I'll be your meat shield. And I was like, uh, you know, meat shields are always, you know, welcome. <laughs> but buck up, man. Jeez, we're, we're going to kill this stuff. I, I was really trying to cheer these guys up and get them into the mindset of uh, adventuring. Um, you know, and plus, I have inspiring leaders. So I got to talk to people for 10 minutes. So I want to uh, inspire them and give them that, uh, you know, improved vitality. So we went through all of that, and that was the team, and we were reading the job. It was for Abigail, and we needed to go to Meridian, uh, which is pretty far away, but it turns out there was a transporter node over by the rum cart. I had no idea. So uh, all we had to do was just walk over there and say the word, Valporth score, or whatever the heck it was, and the next thing you know, we teleported all the way to Meridian. So... Bill Braun immediately throws up and uh, luckily did not get any puke on his brand new unicorn studded leather armor, super beautiful purple, blue, black. And of course, Fargar is very proud of his new unicorn horn that uh, got turned into a javelin of lightning. So uh, yeah, did not puke on that. But man, yeah, next thing you know, we're literally in Meridian and in literally a few minutes are talking to Abigail which is very unusual. I'm used to, you know, a couple of days travel at least to the client location where I get to know my colleagues and we talk about, you know, what we can do, how we like to fight. So yeah, all of this was moving along pretty quickly, but uh, you know, hey, all right, let's roll with this. And uh, yeah, we met Abigail, who was the client. And so apparently what's going on here is that Meridian is very close to the magical disaster zone which is like, uh, you know, a couple miles by 20 miles or something. So pretty big area where things are like really crazy. And apparently there is an uncharted area there called the Everrain. And it was an ongoing project by one of the local kingdoms to kind of explore this area, pacify it, extract its treasures, etc. They had been hiring the Forge Concordance to do mercenary work for them in this endeavor. Uh, Abigail was kind of their intermediary. And so, uh, yeah, that was what they were doing. And Abigail was amazing. She was super organized, had all of these notes uh, written down about past missions, uh, had this bestiary, which had all of these, you know, creatures uh, in it and their characteristics and their ecology and, you know, all of that stuff. Which Bill Brown's like, oh my god, this is amazing. You've got to loan me this to uh, to go on the adventure. And she was like, well, you can take it, but it's going to be, you know, 10,000 gold if you don't bring it back. And I'm like, fine, fine, no problem. We're bringing this back. Because, uh, you know, Bill Brown's pretty confident that he's going to survive. Um, but yeah, anyway, she explained, you know, what the deal was. So I put a hex map on the screen. It was kind of a hex crawl. And so different teams have explored these hexes and uh, we were to explore a few more. There were some uh, safe havens that we could start at and uh, we had to clear four hexes in the eight hours of adventuring that we had and we had to bring back four artifacts, you know, items of interest from each of these hexes. So pretty simple win conditions or at least, uh, you know, easy to understand wind conditions. So we decided to head out scouting with Fargar, even though I've learned that his perception's not that amazing, so I can't really trust necessarily his perception roles. I am gonna be working on that. Everybody knows that I take the terms of engagement super seriously. Having a 
10 passive perception is not fun. It actually makes a difference because pretty much everything that's stealth, um, you know, it uses their, your passive perception. And so I have not noticed anything and I don't like it. I will be fixing that here very soon. But in any case, yeah, so Fargar scouted it out, did not see anything, but I figured there's probably stuff there anyway that he just didn't see. We entered the square commando style, by which I mean using lots of minor illusions and then, you know, dashing from one to the next, you know, oh, I'm in a minor illusion, new minor illusion, dash. All right, look around, M new minor illusion, dash, right? Commando style. And I had my summon way out in front because that just makes a lot of sense, right? If uh, creatures are going to attack, it's way better to attack a summons as opposed to a party member. And yeah, that's pretty much what happened. We uh, went in and this place started to get colder right away. More, uh, the deeper we went into it, we started seeing ice in the stones and stuff around. And I had my summon stone golem way out in front. And yeah, at some point, this giant freaking dragon worm thing pops out of the ground and annihilates my stone golem with like five attacks. And then it burrows under the ground and pops up right underneath us. It got like a surprise round in which it killed the stone golem. And then, you know, to start the real rounds, it was like underneath our feet. So yeah, it was a, a great start. Uh, I guess it wasn't a dragon. Uh, it just looked more like a, a worm. It didn't have wings or flight or whatever, but it did have a breath weapon and that sucked. Um, but my new elemental gift was a, a star for me here. I immediately just flew up. I ate an opportunity attack in the process, but who cares? Just, just knocked off my uh, temporary hit points. And then I got, you know, up in the sky, started barraging it with Eldritch Blast. I had Fargar use his Pyro Converger on it, which I think did double damage because it was like an ice beast and the pyro converter is fire. But Fargar only got one turn of use out of it because uh, pretty quickly the worm unleashed its massive cold wrath weapon and annihilated the entire party besides Bill Ron for like 80 damage, which despite Fargar's cold resistance was enough to wipe him out. And it, yeah, it really, really smashed the rest of the party. So yeah, tough battle, and um, Bill Brown was finally able to kill it with an Eldritch Blast where he first missed, and then I used Inspiration, and I rerolled, and I hit it this time, and I got like a good 12 damage Eldritch Blast, which killed the thing, and thank goodness, because my team was pretty much on its last legs. But yeah, so we killed it, and then we uh, used Firebolts to kind of open up its chest and melt through the chitinous armor that was in front of it, and we're able to find like four tumors inside that we felt pretty confident would satisfy the uh, wind conditions for an artifact. So yay, we succeeded in our first hex. The team was pretty badly hurt though, so we did take a short rest and everybody healed up. And then we went to investigate the uh, second hex. And here we ended up meeting a giant myconid colony and uh, we didn't go aggro. So entering into this hex, it turns out that there were all of these things in the air called rapport spores, which we had inhaled and which had an interaction with the slime stuff that we were wearing because to uh, get prepared, the uh, uh, whole area was being threatened by like aberrants and mind flayers, which kind of seemed to be like the big bads behind like all this, you know, stuff. And so they had available this slime that would prevent the mind flayers from being able to telepathically, you know, do whatever it is that they do to you. Um, and it reacted with these rapport spores. And so we were able to create like a, a, a telepathic bond with the entire party and the entire myconid colony. And so have that kind of mental communication, which Bill Brown is fine with because he's been having that sort of telepathic communication with Fargar ever since he was a baby. Right. And uh, we talked, you know, and this was the myconid's first real, uh, experience with, you know, human or humanoid civilization and the Forge Concordance, but they were having issues with some neighboring tree ants who had been corrupted by the aberrant influence and the mind flayers, again, who are like exerting all this nefarious influence in the region. And, uh, you know, we said, okay, look, we would love to start good relations with you guys. And as a show of good faith and to do you guys a solid, we'll go kill these ants for you. Uh, or treants for you 
um, and then hopefully we can be friends. And they were, you know, a little distrustful, but they seemed to go for it. And so we were like, all right, awesome. And we went to go kill the ant. And um, yeah, this battle was way, way harder than I was expecting. It was only three of them and they were like giant trees. So, you know, Fargar is using the pyro converger and doing a lot of damage with fire. Um, I thought we were going to have a pretty easy victory. Bill Braun came in like at 130 feet elevation, which seemed to be beyond the, um, you know, their reach and was operating through his summons and Fargar and things got off to a good start. My summon did a dreadful scream and managed to frighten all of them. But it got killed pretty quickly because it turns out they could throw boulders. And so they smashed it to death with boulders in like a round or two. Because these things were really hard hitting. They hardly ever missed us. They had like plus 10 to hit. And they were doing like 20-ish damage with each hit. Uh, about 28 with your when we're talking about boulders. Uh, and so, yeah, this one did not go that well. And... It was in large part our fault. We did not focus fire very well. And, you know, that was uh, that was me included because typically in my experience, Fargar has been able to kind of seal off an enemy um, and, you know, just deal with them individually while, while the rest of the party is kind of dealing with the other stuff. And that's what I tried to do here. Um, and it wasn't really working, even though Fargar was doing like tons of damage with his uh, Fyro Converger. I was also keeping him invisible and not having him uh, appear because these things were just hitting so quickly or so heavily and hard that I knew Fargar would die super quickly if I didn't keep him invisible and do kind of like the uh, in and out guerrilla fighting game. Uh, so anyway, yeah, we didn't focus fire very well and these things just stuck around doing, you know, their two attacks per round, never really missing. Well, I mean, a few times because the D DM did roll pretty bad. But man, this fight just went on and on and on. It was so long. It was like eight or nine rounds at a minimum. And I managed to use the pyro converter like four times before it malfunctioned. And then I uh, had Fargar use the jab of lightning. And then Fargar was using, you know, his poison scimitar as per usual. But these things were just like not going down. And fight, we finally managed to kill one. Uh, but the last two were just wrecking the party. At this point, the party was pretty much you know, down or had been down and brought back up, you know, with like a healing word or something. Uh, I brought someone back up with a potion of healing uh, with Fargar uh, at one point. Uh, and then they noticed me with an epic 22 perception roll, which they also took as a free action, which they're not technically supposed to do. But uh, I didn't really notice at the time and didn't call it out. And uh, yeah, then they smashed Bill Braun with three hits um, they each had like two boulder attacks and I think one missed, but three of them hit and I took 80 damage and I have 60 hit points. So thank God I had bludgeoning resistance because that cut the 80 damage to 40 damage, but I'm still sitting there with only 20 hit points and I'm 120 feet up in the air and I am <laughs> feeling quite vulnerable because at that point I was one hit away from death and I felt really exposed hanging out there because these guys were not missing with their boulders. And I only had a 30-foot move speed. So that's where Thunderstep came into play. I was able to descend 30 feet with my move and then make it the rest of the way to the ground with a 90-foot teleport from Thunderstep. And uh, I also did it at a diagonal. So that gave me 120-foot distance from the fighting and behind the tree line because this was a pretty uh, congested area. So they had no idea where I went. So uh, I was pretty safe. I entered stealth mode anyway and got like a 22 stealth. Um, and then started limping my way back because at that point, like, I pretty much thought we were completely dead. And I will say the uh, the party did manage to survive, like a couple of them, a few rounds more than I was expecting. Um, one, that once I bailed and uh, had to enact my backup plan, but uh, yeah, they didn't make it. They got you know uh, killed by the treant. Although they did kill one more, I will give them that. They killed one more, so two of the treants were dead. One was left, had taken some damage, I would guess maybe half damage. Um, but when Bill Braun retreated to the Mykonid colony, he asked for assistance. 
And to be quite honest, the only assistance that I wanted was for them to guard my body while I was taking a short rest and then sending out my summons to rescue the team. But I rolled a 25 on my persuasion roll. So when I asked him for help, I was like super persuasive. And so they got all inspired and a couple of the Mykonid elders stormed over towards the scene of the battle, which was only like 300 yards away or whatever. Uh, and with like this entire army of like little baby Groot looking Mykonid type things uh, along with them. And yeah, they just swarmed the battlefield and smashed into that last tree ant and killed it and then recovered the bodies and recovered our stuff and brought them back. And I was like, oh my God, guys, thank you so much. I was uh, really freaking out. Uh, I thought I was going to be the only survivor, and at that point I was mostly concerned about recovering the bodies and maybe trying to kill the last thing and satisfy the wind conditions. But uh, they definitely went above and beyond what I was expecting and hoping for, actually doing some of the work to kill you know, their enemies, which I uh, role-played as being impressed with, because they were a little bit cowardly at the beginning, I thought. Uh, but anyway, I digress. That's where we were at. Uh, Two of the team were dead. Uh, Azon actually was not dead. He was unconscious, but managed to stabilize. So uh, brought him back, uh, you know, with a potion of healing. And then I put the other two into the ring and we took them down to one of the safe zones to get them raised. And one of the cool things was that the myconid spores that we had inhaled uh, actually acted as a sort of preservative. And so it was very similar to a gentle repose such that we didn't need raise dead to bring them back. We only needed revivify. The problem being, we they couldn't even afford revivifies. So Bill Braun made another epic 25 persuasion roll to get them to uh, do it on loan and that we would pay them later once we got rewarded for this particular mission. Um, and then they would pay a hefty you know, sum of interest. And I would look at the brochures on the way out of the Church of Zosimos, whom I, I guess it was, it's popular. I mean, Basha, our guildmaster, is a member, and Abigail was a member, and if I'm not mistaken, it was actually a church started by a player here. Uh, again, there's a, a giant backstory here that I'm just now coming into contact with. I don't know all the details, but they're pretty solid dudes. I was able to convince them to raise my friends uh, without being paid up front, and, you know, that's a nice thing to do. So, yeah, that was it. We had actually cleared three of the squares. We had only recovered one artifact. And we only had, like, an hour and a half left or something. Like, barely enough time to try and clear one more hex. But two of the guys had just gotten raised and, you know, had, like, one hit point. And so we'd been really hard-pressed uh, so far, even starting at maximum capacity. So we were like, eh. This, this just doesn't make any sense, right? We're, let's, we called it a day. And Bill Brown was upset because, like, to me, we clearly didn't meet the wind conditions, you know? Uh, we only cleared three hexes. We were supposed to do four. We only recovered one artifact. We were supposed to get four. But the other guys managed to convince Abigail to give us full rewards and full pay and full badges on the argument that, hey, we may have only cleared three out of the four hexes, but one of them that we did clear, we created a huge ally in the Mykonid village or the Mykonid colony. And that hex was now going to function as a safe zone and a staging area for future parties to come. And we discovered the interaction between the Rapport spores and the anti mind flayer slime. And, you know, using that, is, you know, is obviously going to have a huge impact on the terms of engagement and the communications for that whole region. So, you know, all things considered, we actually did do enough to meet the wind conditions. And the whole time I'm a little sketchy, you know, listening to this argument, but they made a great persuasion roll. Abigail bought it. And so, yeah, we got full wind conditions for surviving this Nordy game. And Abigail actually went back with us to talk to Basha and to make sure that you know, the church got what it was owed and maybe to flirt with me a little bit. Bill Brown definitely got the sense that she thought that, you know, he was cute. You know, that, that happens all the time. The girls are really annoying with that. They get crushes on me. And then the next thing you know, you know, I'm trying to beat them off with a unicorn horn. But uh, yeah, 
Uh, it was very cool though because I really dug Abigail's style and uh, one of the great things that I got out of this mission was a copy of Abigail's notes which were extremely you know detailed and had all of this information about giants and mind flares and aberrants and lizards and reptiles and stuff so uh, that in itself is uh, extremely valuable and then on top of that I actually got both items <laughs> I got a feather token and I got a potion of growth plus like 350 gold so pretty good mission for me in terms of rewards and I am really, really happy with this uh, adventure because uh, I gotta say, hats off to uh, you know DM Nordy. That was the best session that I've had in a, a long time. It was better than the strafe session because the combats were equally hard and difficult, but the role playing was at such an elevated level. One of the things about DM Nordy is that his world is extremely immersive. He picks great music. He does amazing descriptions, does tons of voices, and has created a, a world that is obviously huge and detailed and consistent uh, that I have just just gotten a, a, a you know a glimpse of. This is my first experience with it, the first time I've touched this large, vast world that he's created, and I really look forward to you know playing more. This is like Adventure Eight out of Twenty Two. Or something um, and I just had so much fun the combats had me on the edge of my seat all night biting my teeth or biting my nails uh, heart pumping adrenaline pounding thought that I you know might have died at that at one point when they started chucking boulders at me um, and, and I just love the role-playing elements and I love the storytelling narrative uh, elements of it I mean uh, at one point when Bill Braun was scouting you know, Fargar saw like a dragon, like a giant dragon way in the background. Um, and then there's like all these fortresses and volcanoes. It's just such a really cool world. And uh, I can't wait to play at it again. So thanks for uh, providing that experience to me, DM Nordy. Thanks to the team for uh, sticking it out and, you know, um, and, and helping me get through it. It was pretty fearsome, but, uh, you know, we all did a good job and we all won it. And uh, thank you so much for watching. This has been Bill Bronze and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Brown Bafflestone. See you next time.